Welcome to Hale Varsity Radio, the voice of Husker Nation. Insight, opinion, expertise, with the biggest and best names talking Nebraska across the state. Join the show on Twitter at Hale Varsity and at Schmitz underscore radio. Call in at 402-466-ESPN or 1-800-825-5865. Here's Chris Schmitz. Welcome to it. Great to be with you on a Wednesday. It's Hale Varsity Radio presented by the Nebraska Lottery. It's Festivus Eve. Some holiday grievances tomorrow, perhaps, on the final show of the year for us on Hale Varsity. Elijah Herbal is in. Chris Schmidt, great to be with you. Numbers to dial us up on a glorious, sunny mid 50s Wednesday, just like it always is in Nebraska. 466 You can find us on Twitter at Schmidt underscore radio. Chris Schmidt at Herbal Essence for Elijah Herbal. And uh, can always email Chris at HaleVarsity.com. A lot to talk about with Coach Tuioti off to Oregon. It's not been officially confirmed by Nebraska but uh, you have folks over there in Duckland saying, welcome back to the West Coast, Coach Tuioti. At least a lot of different uh, media outlets uh, with uh, close to the Ducks program. Mike Babcock will weigh in on Tuioti and uh, all things Nebraska here in 20 minutes. Mike Babcock with Hale Varsity. Mike Shuhart, Shuey's got the old lights put up out at Wilderness Ridge. And uh, it is glorious, and I'm sure there'll be some golf balls uh, swung on and hit here the next couple of days. So we'll talk with Shuey. We had signing day last Wednesday, so we missed him. And then the pride of Fairbury, Bill Dolman. With us, we are off Friday, so we're moving uh, Billy D up to 5 o'clock. We'll have a little bit of a Nebraska preview against Kennesaw State. I laugh because I'm nervous. And then a jock doc to round us out. So time to get in now. If you want to get in, uh, I will get the movie review from one Elijah Herbal on on Spider-Man, because I know you saw that last night. I think we're taking my mom and Junior and me. We're going Christmas Day. We're at least kind of targeting that. So that'll be a little bit later in the program. All right. Give me some thoughts on uh, Coach Tuioti. Uh, my thoughts are these. Uh, good for him. Good for him if there's more money. Good for him if there's more job security with a new coaching staff at Oregon. And good for him finding a, a uh, spot to, uh, to, th- that's familiar. And that's what this is because you look at Coach Tuioti's history. He spent a lot of time at Cal under Coach Wilcox. Did well there. Really good defense. Uh, spent time at Michigan. Spent time at Cleveland. And, and Tuioti's always been a West Coast guy. Nebraska nailed the hire in Coach Tuioti. And Coach Chenander did a wonderful job bringing him in uh, when Coach Dawson left after that first season in 2018. The good news, if there is such a thing for Nebraska, when you lose a, a guy with as high a character and connectivity as Coach Tuioti with his players with that defensive line room, is that you've got a guy that's been a part of recruiting the kids that are still in that room who helped recruit Nash Hudmacher. Well, uh, who helped recruit uh, guys uh, like Ty Robinson, Casey Rogers, guys that you're going to be asking to step up a lot next season in 2022. So we don't know where the, uh, the dominoes will fall with Nebraska, but you would, you would think all right, let's let's see what we can do about moving Dawson back to defensive line and and figure out outside linebacker because Dawson's done a good job with the outside linebackers with Caleb Tanner, Garrett Nelson. Uh, you, you've had both of those guys really continue to grow and get better. And that's what I think of a lot of with, with Coach Tuioti. I think of, of how his defensive linemen have played, right? Do they always get after the quarterback? No. But in a 3-4, their job was to to, to raise hell on the line, stalemate, let the linebackers and the run fits happen. Uh, So this is is not a good loss for Nebraska. Sometimes you want assistance to move on because it ain't working. 
Now, what's Nebraska's recourse here? And I think it's going to be Coach Dawson. You have two spots potentially now open. Uh, If Dawson transitions to defensive line, what happens at outside linebacker? Does Dawson still coach that uh, when it comes to the pass rush side of things? You have Barrett Root. Rudy can do a lot uh, when it comes to coverage uh, because of his expertise in that play in the position. I know he didn't play outside, but he knows to, how to and what to talk to linebackers about when it comes to their pass coverage drops, their responsibilities. He can coach that. So maybe a tag team, the outside backer stuff when it comes to pass rush versus coverage between Rude and um, and Coach Dawson. So that allows one more opening here to fill uh, on the defensive side of the ball or go with a special teams uh, designate, uh, a true coordinator, and that means Bill Bush, likely, uh, you would think if you're Nebraska. And it also opens that spot up for a running backs coach, and you have one of the best there is in Ron Brown here. So maybe you round it out that way. The other alternative you have, Elijah, is to go get somebody that's younger uh, for a running backs coach uh, that can that can go recruit. But I would put Ron Brown's recruiting resume up with anybody in the world. I would put Bill Bush's recruiting resume up there with anybody uh, in college football here the last 15 years. And uh, that's one thing. I know Tuioti was responsible for a lot of the West Coast, uh, but what, what Tuioti really did for me was I saw Ben Stilley, and this, there's a lot of credit that needs to go to Ben Stilley for sure, and, and, and uh, Damian Daniels as well. But I saw them play their best football the more time than the time they had spent with Coach Tuioti. I don't think there's going to be a drop-off in teaching and technique. I think you have two really good coaches, Tuioti and Dawson, on the staff this past year. But I think Dawson can can kind of pick up where Tuioti left off. Uh, it's not good. And if you're Coach Frost, you can't be surprised that the guys are going to be looking in a do-or-die season. You can't be surprised if guys – Uh, Look at what happened to some of the guys on the offensive side of the ball and say, ooh, that could have been us if our defense wasn't very good this year, right? I mean, it's just, it is what it is. And best wishes to Coach Tuioti and and his family if uh, Oregon is that destination, assuming we get an official announcement here from one side or the other. But uh, Nebraska should be able to survive this, but it's never good when you lose somebody as high a caliber as Tuioti. Yeah, and, and I, I've liked what Tuioti's done here. He's, I mean, when you look at defensive line and, and linebackers, front seven, that's arguably the most important position group whenever you're playing in the Big Ten to be able to go stop another team's run. That's so vital, and you saw how well that defensive line got at, at filling their gaps, playing well against the run. Nebraska's best run defense this year since, at least on the eye test, since, what, 2009? 2013, maybe even 09. Uh, their run, run defense this year was solid, and that's why I'm not convinced – that Nebraska is going to be going in house with Dawson and Rude to be able to fill this gap. When you look at just how vital it is, do you want to be putting more on those guys' plates uh, whenever they've already done a good job this year with being able to, to slow down other teams' rushing attacks? Do you, or do you go um, find somebody else to come in and, and, and fill that gap and take where Coach Tui already left off? He's left some talent in the room for whichever position coach is going to be coming in uh, or potentially coming in, I should mm-hmm. say. I, I, I would personally go somewhere else and go bring in a new dedicated defensive so you want line. A new, you want a new voice. Per, I mean, you also look at the, the fact that... The continuity part's the thing that I the, the just the, the, you have had for a little bit on that defensive side of the ball, and, and that's part of this recipe as to why the defense has jumped like they have from 18 to now. Are they great? Are they the 85 Bears? Are they the 09 Huskers? No. But they were, they were the shining light this season, and they, they kept you in every ball game, and damn near single handedly won you some ball games had you not had special team screw ups or turnovers on offense. But yeah, yeah, it, it's, I'm, it's not, saying, it, I'm it, not saying I'm not saying you're wrong. It, it, I'm not just, saying you're yeah. wrong to go. All right, is there somebody even better out there? Maybe, possibly, sure. Right, there's always someone or something better. But does it mesh? Fits so important mm-hmm. right now because of how vital. 22 is 
See, and I just worry whenever you already have Coach Dawson with a pretty dedicated role in the special teams, uh, he's been not the special teams coach, but he's been uh, a pretty leading voice in the special teams coaching role. Do you want to put more on his plate and make him do the defensive line gig too? Because at this point in time, uh, it doesn't sound to me like Nebraska is going out and trying to find a special teams coordinator. I think they already got him. He's um, He's been out recruiting for you. Bill Bush? Yeah. Do you think that he's going to get the official promotion to, to special teams coordinator? That, that's what I'm I'm so unsure about. I If you have a guy like Bill Bush that's that's been an analyst for you and you got him for free last year because LSU was paying him, you're insane not to keep him around and find a way. And and you're insane to, 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 to not try and counter and keep Tuioti. I don't have the perfect answer for you as far as to who's the who should be the odd man out with what you've got currently with your with your offensive analyst in Ron Brown, with your special teams analyst, or excuse me, defensive analyst in Bill Bush, and then you've got Tuioti, and you have one opening for three. Mm-hmm. Okay? Um, I don't have the right answer there. I do know that you've got proven just bulletproof studs that both guys, Ron Brown and Bill Bush, have recruited in their careers. We're talking first picks overall. We're talking All-Americans. We're talking College Football Hall of Famers. We're talking some of the all-time greats at Nebraska. And Ron Brown's the uh, – he's, he's 65 going on 45. The question is, what does he want to do? And you saw the running backs – performed pretty high in my humble opinion the last two weeks that he was kind of in charge of them um they didn't run for a ton of yards but they you knew the running game was there against wisconsin and you saw yant really play his best football since northwestern after kind of a roller coaster setup situation this season with ron kind of tutoring and training him so I, I think I think Ron's where you go at running backs. I think you, you you say Bill go handle special teams and give us some takes defensively, and Bill and Ron go recruit uh, that first through third round talent you've done through most of your career. But do you not think that if Ron Brown and Bill Bush were going to be the two guys that that would have been announced by now? It's just been so long. There's got to be something going on behind well, the scenes you, down at Memorial Stadium. You, you you just you probably didn't know you. You didn't know you were going to lose a coach. Maybe you did. That's that's the thing. What, what's the shock level right now with Coach Frost? Mm-hmm. Did did he? Th- you know, I mean, Travis Fisher's been courted a lot, right? And and he's the name that, that's ob- always obvious with who's Nebraska. Who could Nebraska lose, right? And and Fish is always the first, second, and third name you hear, right? And and if you're if you're Coach Dawson, not that he's thinking this. I don't know what he's thinking, but he's gone to the NFL once, right? You know, who's to say with the world of football and and how many changes there are? Is he getting called back to the NFL again? I don't I don't know this. I'm just, you know, it, it's 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 a turbulent time in the world of coaching. It just is, specifically here uh, in college football. You've got staffs and new staffs, and I tell you what, the 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 Oregon hire and what they're they're doing is they are going after some monster fish. Uh, Tosh was your money recruiter for Saban, right? And he's, and I will butcher his last name. It's not Leopold, obviously, but uh, uh, Tosh is going to be on Oregon staff. Tosh is going to go get you a uh, pretty impressive lineman. But Tuioti, if things hold to be true with him being the, the new defensive line coach there, I mean, he'll what he does great is is his technique, his 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 ability to teach and guys just get better under him so you t- you pair elite d-line talent with his teaching ability and, and his ability to connect and recruit as well i mean you could you could be set up uh pretty high at oregon so we'll see where nebraska goes we'll see what nebraska's recourse is and what they do on staff i I think there's always got to be a plan. I mean, we and I mean we we've not seen Whipple in action at Nebraska other than his roundtable last Wednesday, but so far so good. If Nebraska goes outside what they have on hand, uh, they'll they'll figure it out. There's 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 coaches out there. There's openings. There's there's staff transitions going on. 
I don't think – I'll say this. I have enough confidence in the ability of Bill Bush and Ron Brown that Nebraska is not just settling. All right. I think there's two guys on staff that are completely hireable for a lot of other staffs in Ron Brown and, and Bill Bush. Okay. So that's – it's not just, well, just – Give it to a couple of former Nebraska. No. These guys are proven. They're good. And there's an opportunity to, to have now both on staff full time in coaching roles. Uh, and if you just transition it and kind of divvy up things the right way. And I just want to add, I think the the fit for Tuyoti going to Oregon makes a lot more sense for him where he has been recruiting mo- mainly on the West yes. Coast. I think he's struggled to get some of the talent that he wants to Nebraska. You look at his recruiting profile and none of the defensive linemen that are getting significant snaps were Tony Tuyota's guys that he was the primary recruiter. The one you could argue he was a secondary recruiter on Nash Hutmacher. I believe the main recruiter was rude on that one. I could correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it just I, I'm not sure the fit was always there uh, in terms of recruiting to Nebraska. He was always a great developer of talent, mm-hmm. Tuyoti was, but uh, I'm not sure the recruiting fit, who he was, who he was trying to bring in here was always a fit. Well, it's just a hard sell. It's a hard, oh, super hard sell. Right? I mean, and I, you and I both like scoff at saying, well, Nebraska is a hard sell, but it, it is a, a harder sell from a West Coast and, and maybe the Polynesian connection. I mean, a lot of those Polynesian kids end up staying or going to Hawaii or they end up at Utah or they go to Washington or they go kill it at Oregon because there's a there's a history. Come on out to Nebraska. He'll get a visit. Maybe he'll get he'll, 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 he'll take the phone call, but we'll see where Nebraska goes. We'll get Mike Babcock's thoughts. Hail Varsity continues. And now and now back to Hail Varsity Radio. Thanks for hanging out on a Wednesday. It's Hale Varsity presented by the Nebraska Lottery. I said Tosh, not the comedian, but uh, Lou Poy is the co-defensive coordinator. That's the name. Uh, I didn't say Tosh the comedian. Daniel Tosh? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. The, is that show even still on? I don't, I don't know. It's been a while. I don't, I don't think so. Yeah. We say hi to Mike Babcock, historian, author, Hall of Famer, Husker Football Insider at MD Babs on Twitter. Babbers, make a phone call to the Gator Bowl and tell him you know of a football team that was three and nine, but man could have been nine and three if if someone's looking for a dance partner with Wake. Can you do that? Yeah, there you go. Um uh, no, I don't know anybody there, but uh um that would be a that would be a good – well, the positive thing would be you'd get those extra practices. That would be a good thing. That would be great. Um, yeah, that would that would be really good. Boy, it's going to be crazy, isn't it, through, going through this bowl game uh, season. I, I, I saw uh, um, National Football Foundation or, the, you know, the actually the fo- football writers, maybe mm-hmm. it came across today uh, uh, about uh, – what they would do if COVID affects the playoffs. Mm-hmm. Um, and if one team is affected by COVID to the extent they can't play uh, in the semifinals and the other team has designated the winner, it's a forfeit. Um, they go all the way to the championship game. And if one team can't play in the championship game because of COVID, then the other team is declared the champion. If neither one of them can play, then there's no contest and there's no champion this year. Um, it's it's kind of that's odd uh, and horrific to think about. It kind of goes back to some of the pre bowl polls that that declared a team a champion before the bowl game. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, didn't we have news today that that Michigan got their entire team their booster shots instead of having like practice today? They all just went and had a, a booster clinic for their team. So so Michigan should be all right. I know that Coach O'Brien and. Uh, you had the O-line coach for Alabama both tested positive for COVID. So you, you wonder if Bama, they don't play for a while. Yeah, they've got, still. they've got plenty of time to, to recover from that. And there, and there were, for the other, uh, the other couple of bowls in that, um, the, the six, um, there was the opportunity to actually, uh, delay it, uh, maybe a week. Mm, okay. Um, if, if, if that became a problem, but but obviously that's not something you can do with the with the playoffs. So um, yeah, and and to put that information out now obviously is going to put some emphasis emphasis on it for the for the programs. And and if uh, Michigan did that today, you know that's a good example of 
how you go about uh, making sure or doing everything you can mm-hmm. to make sure that uh, you can play those games. Mike, uh, reaction to, to Coach Tuioti and uh, off to Oregon. No official confirmation yet from Oregon or Nebraska, but football scoop saying it's, good, it's pretty much a done deal, and they're they're pretty right on the mark usually uh, when and if this is announced here in the next 24 to 48 or five hours or whatever the timeline is. You know, what's your impressions of Tui Odie's time in Lincoln? Um, you know, I am was disappointed to see that. Um uh, because I think he's done a really good job of of preparing uh, his, his players, and uh, you know, with with everything that's happened, um, releasing the four assistants and on offense, and and uh, uh, and now to lose a one of your defensive assistants, and you know, going into the off season, I, I kind of wondered if they would lose. Uh, I, I even wondered if they'd lose Chenander just because of the uncertainty. And I think Elijah maybe mentioned it or you did earlier that, uh, um, you know, that's one of the things that, that could motivate a coach to want to leave here is just the uncertainty beyond next season. You know, are you looking at being here one more season and then the changes are going to be made or um, is there a chance that there's going to be some job stability? And, you know, I understand it in college football and football in general, professional football, you know, it, it's always a, there's always uncertainty. You're always going to be concerned about that. But, but Nebraska's in a situation where it does look like there may not be a lot of stability. So um, that's probably one of the reasons that, uh, that the, you know, Tuioti considered that. Um, yeah, and as you guys pointed out, you know, going to the West Coast, probably more comfort, more of a comfort level there. But um, I just, uh, yeah, I was disappointed to see him uh, go if, if that's actually what happens. And mm-hmm. it certainly appears that it will. Um, that's, that's a blow to Nebraska, I think, um, because, I, you know, staff continuity is really important to, to, to my way of thinking. And you sort of cancel that out on offense with the guys that you fired. I mean, Mike, whenever you, you look at the, the talent that's currently in that defensive line room, I know there's some uh, some headed to the NFL draft this offseason, but still a lot of talent remaining in that room. Do you think that could encourage a, a coach from a different school to, to jump ship and come to Nebraska, seeing the talent that the defensive line has and just the potential that this defense has and how they've continued to grow year after year? Or, or do you think that uh, it makes more sense for Nebraska to, to stay in-house uh, with replacing Tony Tuyoti? Well, I think if you're going outside the program, for sure, it's probably a show-me-the-money kind of thing as much as it is talent. You know, um, what's, what is the opportunity? What are you going to pay me? And and, uh, and then uh, you look at the talent level. Uh, to my way of thinking, um, Scott, uh, this is based on nothing. This is just my perception, but... You know, maybe Scott had an idea that he was going to lose at least one a defensive assistant, or um, and it, and maybe that's why they they haven't named a running backs coach yet because he wanted to see exactly how things were going to shake out um, before you made that decision on that on that fourth coach. And now you you know now you've got a you've got another one, um, and you know possibly as as, as you discussed it could be uh, in-house that you would look at that or um you know maybe they've got some idea of uh, uh who they want to who they want to pursue uh, you know outside the program but um I, do, I just got the sense that maybe that's why they didn't name that fourth assistant coach because scott maybe had a sense that uh, somebody else was going to be leaving as well on on the defensive side of the ball so you know how how do you want to put that together with with uh uh running backs uh defensive line what do you want to do there and uh and special teams how do you want to handle that well you've got bill bush who's been out recruiting and uh part of nebraska's staff also ron brown uh kind of stepped up and and was on field coach with uh with held's release so you've got two guys who know the program, two guys that have thrived in the program. 
right there. Do you? I mean, that's kind of my argument for in-house, and it's not just the settle. No, you're not settling. You're 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 kind of reinstating two guys that have done a just a miraculous job when they've been at Nebraska, either recruiting or coaching or both. Then development too. Yeah, no, I, I agree. They've got two good guys there, and you've discussed this as well. But I mean, could you? Could you have Dawson work with the interior defensive line and the outside linebackers and, you know, maybe Barrett Rude works with the outside linebackers a little bit as well, mm-hmm. and you bring Bill Bush in as a special teams coordinator and he works with the safeties, which is what he did um, previously when he was in Nebraska. You know, I think he worked with the safeties and – and the special teams. He did outside backers, too, uh, I think, in yeah. 04. I mean, so, okay. so Bush, has, Bush has done outside backers before. So he could do – he could fit in somewhere there um, and have the special team's responsibility as well, which, you know, my position on that, I think it has to be somebody that's doing something else as well, mm-hmm. um, not just special teams. And then um, I would like to see Ron Brown as the running backs coach I don't know if Ron is inclined to want to do that to go back to coaching full time or not. Um, I think he would be really a good a good fit for Nebraska. He's just a great he's a great coach. He's a great person. He can recruit, um, and I'm going to repeat it. He's a great person. So um, you can't go wrong there. Well, and I say this with uh, with Ron and with Bush, and then you got Mickey Joseph. Chin's been an incredible recruiter, an eye for talent as a coordinator, and that's not always a case. Okay, uh, I mean you're uh, th- that's a pretty good three headed monster there of, of 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 recruiters, let alone guys that can coach and develop. Mike, uh, a thought here before we wind down, bud, and we uh, we love having you on. I appreciate uh, you so much, and Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays to you and your family. What does the crystal ball in the Babbers house say? about Husker basketball tonight, the men? Uh, I think they win tonight. Uh, get a little better reason for optimism there. Uh, and do, and don't play one of those games where you play about 10 minutes where things look good and then all of a sudden it looks like everybody just decides that uh, that's it and you kind of go into the twilight zone and it's <laughs> not a positive twilight zone that you go into. I, I just, I think there's talent there, you know, and, and I'm, Hoping that uh, Trey McGowan's is back in January, mm-hmm. um, which is kind of the indication there. It was tough that they lost Breidenbach. Um, I think they have talent, but, man, they have to play together and they have to have some kind of a system. It's almost like we're talking the same thing that we were talking about football at the beginning of the season, you know. you got to get a system, and you got to stick to that system instead of playing uh, – uh, one-on-one with, with five guys out there on the court. Yeah, the system works, and it can work, and it's worked to okay to good starts, the last few Power Five showdowns, and then you just kind of – you uh, you go away from it, and, and then it's helter-skelter, and folks are annoyed. Yeah, I mean, at some point it's like – well, thanks for your time this time. Till next time, you know, take care of yourself, and then, then off they go, and everybody goes his own way. So, um, hopefully, that'll that'll get squared away, and it'll be a more a question of Nebraska has does Nebraska have the talent in the, in a game uh, to be successful, rather than is Nebraska going to play in an organized way to to be successful. Mike, uh, have a great uh, holiday weekend. We'll get caught up here in the new year, bud. Thanks so much. Same to you, folks. Happy holidays to you and your listeners. All right, Mike. Appreciate you. Mike Babcock, historian, author, Hall of Famer with Hale Varsity at MD Babs on Twitter. And uh, take care of that Husker fan when it comes to uh, holiday gift giving. You can subscribe to HaleVarsity.com and magazine, uh, the digital, the print, incredible. Uh, and uh, wonderful uh, specials for you. HaleVarsity.com backslash subscribe. Mike Schuhart. Uh, Shuey will be talking some December golf on the way with Hale Varsity. And now. And now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. Well, this man went full Griswold out at Wilderness Ridge with the lights 
As you enter into Wilderness Ridge, it is uh, beautiful, and it's even better because it's sunny and 50, which means someone's teeing off. We say hi to Mike Shuhart, Wilderness Ridge Golf. Shuey, Merry Christmas, bud. Merry Christmas. Doesn't feel much like Christmas, though, does it? I'm okay with that because I got a tea time Friday, brother. <laughs> that a boy. <laughs> I'm going to lose money to Iowa Russ. <laughs> But it'll be money well spent. So I got to ask you, uh, is as good as Charlie Woods was last weekend, could Charlie Woods make the Divot Dogs? Uh, I think I'd give him a spot on my team. He's pretty solid. Who was better at, at age 12, Tiger or Charlie? Charlie. That's All impressive. Wow. That is impressive. He's, he's 12 years old. He's already got the swagger. <laughs> well, 11, <laughs> he, 11 straight birdies doesn't lie. That's pretty awesome. So you've, you've coached a, a lot of kids and a lot of uh, college players. <laughs> Tell me what your eyes see. Uh, you mentioned the swag already, but let's review uh, just a touch here on PNC from last weekend. Uh, what, what did last weekend say or show you uh, with, your, with your golf expertise about Charlie Woods? Uh, he, you can tell he's got some pedigree obviously being tiger's son but that doesn't always correlate man i know a lot of great golfers that have struggled you know but he's got a fabulous golf swing i mean very technically sound uh he has a feel for the game he's got a swagger for the game so it's at a 12 year old to be that fundamentally sound in what he does it's going to be fun to watch him continue to uh, progress. You know, he's, he's already got a lot of the tools. Now it's just maturity, experience, strength, all those things that that will come along as he gets older. And patience, you know, that's one of the big things in golf. You've got to be very patient because some things you just can't do until you're it's available for you to do. And that only takes time, you know, so is he going to be patient enough? Which he will. I mean, he's He's been around. He's around some of the greatest out there. Watch what his dad does. His dad knows you know, the routine. So it's, it's going to be fun to see how good he really gets. Mike Schuart's with us, Wilderness Ridge, Wilderness Ridge Golf. Shuey, let's go back in time for a second. When Tiger was, was Charlie's age, I mean, was he on your guys' radar? I mean, what was – was Tiger known as this this young phenom? I mean, I remember seeing news stories and hear about Tiger, and then his time at Stanford, and then obviously he did what he did at the at, you know the PGA level. But were you guys hearing about this young phenom back then? Yeah, you know he was on the Ed Sullivan show when he was like five years old, mm-hmm. hitting all kinds of crazy shots. You know, my first experience with him was it was 1990. It was my first year on the tour. And I, I got into the L.A. Open, and there was a big thing in the papers all week because they gave this sponsor's exemption to this 16-year-old kid from California named Tiger Woods. So it was a big deal because there were some, some really – L.A. is a hard tournament to get into. Mm-hmm. So there were some really famous golfers that actually didn't get into the tournament, you know, because Tiger – they gave Tiger a spot, this 16-year-old kid. So it's like, did he really deserve it, blah, 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 blah. So I was fortunate enough to actually play in the group right behind him in that tournament. So you could tell just watching him play what he was capable of being able to do. And as I read more and, and talked more, you know, cause coming from the Midwest, you know, him being a California kid, you didn't hear that much about him, but then you could tell that this guy had something special just watching him play. And, uh, the rest is history. I mean, he he didn't make the cut, but I mean, he just hit shots that were that were true caliber shots and quality shots at 16 years of age. You know, so it's like, and everybody was predicting that he was going to go on and do what he did, and obviously he did. So, yeah, uh, he's a he was been a phenom all of his life. Mike, what is the age whenever you you watch a kid golf, and and that's whenever you know like this kid could be something special? Is it is it Charlie's age is it like twelve, or, or is it closer to that that age where uh, you first saw Tiger at sixteen? Usually, it's about that age. You get some that that kind of maybe nine, ten year old age, 
but then you really start seeing it, you know, at that kind of 11, 12, so they start developing a little bit. And you kind of you kind of tell at that time whether they kind of have a love for the game, or they really like being out there, you know, because most kids, their attention span isn't great. And golf, you know, golf takes your ability to stay focused for a long period of time. So you kind of start seeing if they kind of have a passion for it then. And you start seeing their kind of their skill set. Um, I got a couple of kids that are, are kind of that, not quite Charlie, but pretty close. That, you know, just technically – how they play, that love, they want to come out to the golf course and play. That's one of the biggest things is that do they really have a passion for it, you know, because it's not easy all the time, man. It's, it's very difficult, time-consuming, and, uh, you know, some kids, I have a, little, a young man that, that plays out here that plays for us, Leo Hong, uh, and, he, and he loves to come to the golf course. You know, it's like that's something you don't, Teach somebody, that's something that they just, they have, they love. you got to have a love for the game. Mike Shewart's with us, Wilderness Ridge Golf, Hale Var City Radio. Shuey, uh, before we talk wilderness here, a thought on little John Daly. <laughs> what <laughs> what'd you see out of him, other than that big old pig suey uh, pullover? Yeah. He, he chip off the old block. Looks like uh, Daddy taught him well. Looks a lot like Daddy. Plays a lot like Daddy. You know, I, I watched it the one day, and I'm like going, did he cut his pants off? I think he did. I think he cut his pants off to make them shorts before they teed off. That's something John would do. Go, nice. Nice look. So, yeah, another super talented kid. You know, you watch those two play, and they, they're tremendous players, but two different type of players. Just like John. John's a very field player, and his son is, plays just like John. Tiger's a very technical player. You know, you watch little Charlie, he's very technically sound. So it's funny how they kind of mirror one another, you know, and they kind of play like they learn. Mm-hmm. They feel, kids are amazingly, they mimic what they see, so if they're playing with their dad all the time, they mimic that, you know. So it, it's kind of fun because I see that a lot when I, when I kind of teach parents and children that the child is a lot like the parent because that's, that's what they grow up seeing. Chewy, uh, great holiday time right now at Wilderness Ridge. Memberships for sure available. The holiday lights for sure. And what's all going on with you guys out there this weekend? Uh, we got all kinds of stuff going on. If you haven't come out at night and looked at the lights, they're beautiful. Lights shining off of the pond on number nine, so it's, it's beautiful. Memberships are going crazy, you know, getting in before the first of the year. So Cammy, our membership director, she's – been quite busy the last week signing people up for the new year so it's super exciting They're still working on the pool getting closer every day it's a lot of exciting stuff well uh, get a hold of shuey get that golf game fixed up and uh think about the membership for the family uh, you'd really love it shuey we are off for bowl we pray bowl games next week and uh we will get up uh, with you at the beginning of 2022 all right you got it so thanks for having me. Happy New Year, everybody. All right, buddy. Take care. There he is. Good stuff from Mike Shuhart. Wilderness Ridge Golf will wind down Hour 1 next on Hale Varsity. And we're back. Fellas, you think we could listen to the radio? On Hale Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Yes! That's awesome! One final time this hour, Hale Varsity, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal. So we are going to get the uh, Spider-Man review shortly. I love the tweet from the pig farmer, Brett Bielema. Let the Gator Bowl know that he's just sitting by the phone. And the Illini with their, what's what's the uh, academic thing? Not RPI, but something like that. Oh, oh, the. Yeah. How you did academically is going to – Nebraska used it to get in the a- foster – API, is that it? Thank you. Uh, the, the foster farms bowl, remember that against UCLA, mm-hmm. you know, when Nebraska was 5-7, and seven, they ended up 6-7, and seven, they got to the bowl game, they played that card, which, fine, uh, it was a good bowl game uh, for Nebraska. And uh, Illinois, right there, I mean, they were knocking on a – on a, on a six-win season, they just fell short. They played pretty good ball down the stretch. And uh, we'll see if they 
get in. Reminder about uh, using your safety belt. Uh, use your seat belt to save lives and prevent injuries only if it's properly worn. So buckle up. A message from the Nebraska Department of Highway Safety Office. Uh, buckle up this holiday season. Hour two, we will dive into who's still left on the board. Quarterback portal-wise, we'll also get some thoughts from the mayor as Nebraska and Kennesaw State get rocking. that tip off 6, 6.30? 6.30. Down at PBA. I think Nebraska's favored by 11 and a half. Dare I say it? So uh, we'll, we'll go there. Okay. Christmas Day, we are going to hit Spider-Man. That's the plan. Was it worth it? You uh, you saw it last night. I'm not a huge Marvel Spidey. I don't dislike, but I'm not camping out to see it. Okay, so I've seen a lot of the Marvel um, Avenger stuff, and I like the the Spider Man character that's been in it. Yay or nay? What two thumbs up, sideways, down? What do you think? So I, I'm kind of in the same boat as you are. I've gotten excited for this movie based on one of my roommates. It's a movie, book right? Fan, we can yeah. go go to a movie and have a beer. <laughs> and, and and I've liked Tom Holland as Spider Man. I, I do think when you go look online, I think it's got like a 94 percent approval rate on uh, IMDb and Rotten Tomatoes has it up there high too. And I think that's because it's been the the fanboys and fangirls of Spider Man going out and seeing it early. The people who have gone and seen yeah, it early, they, and they of, love it. Of course, they're gonna love it. I thought a little bit overhyped still a solid movie I, i've been trying to is trying there to, kind of a prequel to this or no yes and no D- okay did, did you watch uh what was the last one far from home is that it so yeah have, have you seen the th- the other two tom holland spider-man movies no. he's been in two that's somewhat helpful but they do do <laughs> they do a good job of prefacing what I'm has happened hosed. They do a good job of prefacing what has happened early. If you just go see it as a standalone, you'll be fine. You should be able to understand. Is this time it travel stuff? No, 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 okay. no. There's there's a there's a little bit of uh, multiverse okay. in there. Uh, did you ever watch the Doctor Strange Marvel movie? No, mm, that one's also. I helpful, saw I know. saw like Endgame, and that's kind of it. Okay, yeah, you, you'll you'll enjoy it. You won't probably be wowed by it. I wasn't like, wow, this is the greatest movie I've seen this year, but I was thoroughly entertained for two, two and a half hours. And that's all yeah. you can really ask for. Yeah, there you go. So that that's my plan, that and lots of prime rib. Oh, so, oh I'm so excited for some prime rib. Yeah, it'll be good. It'll be good. Bill Dolman's on deck coming up here in hour two. Get your emails in, Chris at Hale Varsity. Dot com. A lot of Tuioti talk today. Nebraska's next move is what? Uh, stay with us here. Hail Varsity continues presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Welcome to Hail Varsity Radio, the voice of Husker Nation. Insight, opinion, expertise with the biggest and best names talking Nebraska across the state. Join the show on Twitter at Hail Varsity and at Schmitz underscore radio. Call in at 402-466-ESPN or 1-800-825-5865. Here's Chris Schmitz. Welcome to an hour two. It's Hale Varsity presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays to you off on Friday. And uh, he is our Friday uh, staple. We say hi to Bill Dolman. We move him up to Wednesday. Uh, the pride of Fairbury, Billy D at Bill Dolman on Twitter. Merry Christmas, man. How are you? Well, Merry Christmas to you. I'm a little screwed up now because usually I rely on my, my Friday slot as the time that sets my calendar as to knowing exactly what day and what time it is and after that and before that i really don't know so this is going to screw me up for the rest of the week but nevertheless great to be with you and yes happy uh holidays merry christmas to everybody so the news that's not officially released per oregon or even nebraska commenting but uh coach tuioti being courted by Coach Lanning, the the new head man at, at Oregon from Georgia, as uh, the defensive line coach. Uh, uh, if that does become official, and it pretty much is without the uh, the email uh, reaction to that, what do you think of of Nebraska's D line under Tuioti? And uh, are you are you freaked out a little bit that Nebraska lost somebody uh, on the defensive side of the ball? No, to me, it's just the nature of the, the business nowadays, and uh, it, it doesn't surprise me. And I think when you when you bring in somebody to be an assistant coach these days, you you almost have to bring them in, especially when they're young. 
and they're talented, and they have a great reputation, and they've been a couple of other places. I know he'd been at what Cal and had been at his alma mater in Hawaii. He'd been at Michigan and been in the NFL a little bit. Clearly, you know, he's a guy who has been looking to, to take steps up the coaching ladder. And given his um, his ties, geographic ties, uh, and his background to the West Coast, uh, you would assume that at some point, after whatever successes he's had, wherever he is, he's looking to make a move and probably to get back closer to home. And you know, so it, it, it really doesn't surprise me. Um, is the timing great? No, uh, but he did get Nebraska through the the early signing date in December and did his job. Now, is everybody going to be loyal to their commitment to Nebraska that was recruited by him? I, I guess in the era of the transfer portal, that remains to be seen. But I, I just think you know, when when you're bringing in a young coach like that. And I know he's not terribly young, like he's not 22, but he's got a lot of career left ahead of him. Um, and you wouldn't think that, you know, this at Nebraska is probably the, was going to be the final, you know, landing spot. Now, maybe he would have fallen in love with the place and, and, and it would have been a long term marriage, but it doesn't surprise me and it doesn't freak me out. Um, Scott's obviously been scouring the assistant coaching, you know, resumes over the last you know, a couple of months now anyway. But I also, in looking between the big red lines, I wonder if as this coaching carousel ride began, you know, in the middle of the season for everybody, if it wasn't expressed to Scott, I'm going to start looking. I've been here three years. We've had great success here. My name is hot. And it's maybe time for me to explore other opportunities. I just, Scott, I'm just saying this could have happened. I want to let you know that this is a possibility that I'd like to get for, you know, get back home. Why haven't we had any movement on a running backs coach? Why hasn't there been a decision made about a special teams coordinator? Bill Bush and Ron Brown are eminently qualified for any job, right? So has this sort of been on Scott's radar for the last couple of months? And that's why no other moves had been made with other coaches, at least none that I know about, and two that would be perfect where they are right now. That's just me looking at it in a brilliant way. Bill Dolman's with us here at Hale Varsity Radio. And Bill, on one hand, it seems like this move makes some sense, but on the other hand, Tuioti was still out doing some work on the recruiting trail in December. Uh, I think he brought in uh, Brody Tagaloa, and uh, there was one more kid, uh, names escape me, he was also putting in some work. So uh, do you think that a coach is still going to be going out, putting in work on the recruiting trail if he knows there's a good chance he's going to be leaving in the offseason? I know it's, that's a part of the job description. Part uh, of the job. Just, it's part of the job. You know, you, you Until you sign the dotted line that you're going someplace else, you're not going to be out there going, hey, I'm not quite sure I'm going to stick around Nebraska because I'm, I'm kind of looking around, but never. I would bet Mickey Joseph was, was recruiting for LSU right up until he decided uh, you know, to sign with Nebraska. I'm sure when Brian Kelly got hired, Mickey was probably someplace you know, trying to get somebody else. Uh, that's just the nature of the business. Even if and they're offering once- Toyota's son? Brian Kelly was walking out of a living room when he got the call <laughs> to, uh, right. to, to make it, the know- move. It, you, you are working for who you're working for, or at least you better be. So you're not until until you've got another gig. And and I'm just I'm just saying if 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 you're Coach Toyoti, and and you're at this stage of your career and you've had great successes, you you might be saying to Scott, look, if there's an opportunity that comes up, we'd like to get back home or whatever the case might be. Uh, I'm sure that you know four, eight, six weeks ago he's not looking at. Hey, I think Dan Lanning's going to get the job at Oregon. No. But you're thinking, okay, there might be some movement other places. You know, USC had been looking forever. Maybe he had that on his radar. Uh, maybe he had it on his radar that, uh, you know, the, the Washington job came open a long time ago, um, you know, for a D.C. position or something. So I'm, I'm just saying you, you are always – you always have to have your radar, whether you are actively seeking or not, unless you, you go back to the glory days of Nebraska football. Who other than Kevin Steele was looking around? Milt wasn't going anywhere. Dan wasn't going anywhere. Crazy George, Uncle George wasn't going anywhere. Charlie, I mean, those guys had established roots and had, you know, created, you know, one of the greatest coaching staffs in the history of college football. Kevin Steele, we knew, was, you know, was young and had moved around and was always going to be looking to attack that coaching ladder to get a head coaching job or whatever the case might be. 
I knew that because I helped Kevin do his resume while he was an assistant coach. Hold on, okay? hold on, hold on. We're, we're going to go. So I want to I want to go back to that conversation because you can do the steel voice. <laughs> and and so, what did you do for his resume? Well, we, you know, Ke- I recruited Tommy <laughs> Frazier. I beat his mom <laughs> well, at cards. No, I mean, it, was just, it was just, you know, Kevin and I had a good relationship, and you know, in uh, I'm probably closer in age to me as a college, you know, out of just out of college, and he mm-hmm. was to some of his peers and began the coaching office. But we had a good relationship, and he, re- ex- you know, respected my my ambitions in my career. I think we had, you know, similar obviously different businesses but i had ambitions to to move up my the ladder and 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 i could write and mm-hmm. I, I think we just you know we respected each other and and uh and so yeah but i i knew that you know that he had aspirations beyond nebraska and this that should be no secret I, and i and i could see coach tuyote in in that mold that uh and all the other coaches that eventually like javon dewitt, DeWitt moved mm-hmm. you know went back to north carolina or went back uh east so I, I don't find it odd that, that he's moving on. I, I think that this is probably something that he thought, okay, three years in Nebraska, great opportunity. We had great success. I'm hot right now. And if something comes open and it's a great opportunity and it's stupid money, then, you know, Scott, I, 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 I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look a little bit. And maybe nothing materializes. You know, maybe the only job he got, offer he would have gotten, I'm just saying this, you know, for an example, was, you know, hey, Fresno State's looking. Uh, for a defensive coordinator, just for example, probably not better than helping to rebuild Nebraska football with a great defensive line and you wait another year, right? So I, 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 I'm not surprised that he's moving on. I don't think this is a shock, and I guess it's probably not a shock to Scott. Do you think Scott makes the – and I, I've said this a couple of times, you're not settling. You're really lucky to have a guy like Bill Bush and, and Ron Brown – right there for you to plug in. I, I, totally. hope it, I, I hope it's not that hard a decision, I guess, is what I'm saying. Well, well and, that, and that would be mine, you know, personally, as you know, looking at it from a personal standpoint, uh, knowing those guys and being a Nebraska guy and understanding that those guys understand, and I say this collectively, understand us. They understand Nebraska football. And Bill has obviously been a lot of places, too. And has you know deep connections down in in Louisiana, and in the southeast. And Ron Brown can go into any living room anywhere in the country and sell moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas and say we're going to take care of your son. So uh, you know I, I think yeah they're home run hires if you ask me. But that's you know Scott's going to make the decision that's that's best for the chemistry as as he wants to put it. But those guys are already there, so they clearly have fit in. But personally. Knowing them and being a fan, I, I think that it's kind of fallen into Scott's lap. And then you just maybe you know make the adjustments with the, you know, with the staff. And, and Mike Dawson is now the defensive line coach. Well, I would think a guy who's got his experience and has been in the NFL could probably make that adjustment. You know, well, that's what he was doing before coach. he left. You know, I mean, right. it's, it's well, going right. back to, to 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 square one for him. Yeah, right. And 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 the guys who are coming back know him. Um, they know what he's like. They know his personality. And, you know, I know Bill has probably been more of a secondary coach, but if they decide to, to say, hey, you're going to, you know, coach OLBs now, okay. <laughs> I'm guessing as long as Bill's been around, he can make whatever adjustment needs to be made, and, and then you work special teams collectively or something. And, you know, I would trust Ron Brown with any position group anywhere, any, you know, at any time. So I, I think it's just – uh, maybe that, and maybe that's why no move has been made. You know, people keep wondering when is when is Scott going to make the move with a running backs coach or a special teams coordinator? Again, I go back to maybe he knew that you know Tuyoti was looking, and that there was a great possibility that he may go to USC if somebody else had gotten hired, or uh, Washington if they'd gone that you know different direction. And it just so it happened that it's now, and so maybe that's why Scott has been waiting to see. You know what was going to transpire with the guys who are on staff. Anybody was going to leave, and now it turns out that they are. Bill Dolman's with us, NBC Sports, Pride of Fairbury, uh, and uh, of course follow him on Twitter at Bill Dolman. Bill, a good article by the Athletic. They put together the top fifty bowl games. Nebraska making a lot of memorable bowl games, specifically eighties and nineties. What's your What's your best bowl memory? You were You were uh, on all of those trips. 
No, there's not a lot of them. The, the, one, the memories that really stick out are arriving in Miami and all of the, uh, uh, the folks of Nebraska who had been stuck inside for the winter with no tan in 50-degree Miami weather hitting the beach. I always thought that was quite a memorable scene with every bowl game we went to and stayed at the Sheridan Bell Harbor. So Nebraska fans flocking to the beach with all the Germans that were there, I always <laughs> look forward to that every, uh, every bowl trip. Uh <laughs> You know, uh, it was quite a sight. But anyway, uh, <laughs> you know, the, of, of the trips, you know, obviously the national champion games uh, and in the Orange Bowl stand out, um, you know, beating Miami 24-17. And, and I was just thinking about that today. Was that a, a great Miami team, or did we just make that Miami team look pedestrian? And I think, and I think their defense more the was latter. great. I think their defense There was were great, great athletes on there, you know, and, and – you know, we get beat by Gino Toretta or Ryan Walsh or something, or Steve Walsh, I don't know, one of the Walshes. But was, you know, was Frank Costa really any different than those guys? Probably not. You know, he wasn't with one of the great Miami quarterbacks. But, you know, a lot of those games rolled together. A lot of them, unfortunately, were forgettable. Some Florida State Bowl games in Miami and then at the Fiesta Bowl. would like to have, you know, kind of forgotten those. Um but I, I, the, the the winning national championship games, and maybe it was just because of the access that I had to be on the sidelines and in the locker room, and and just to see the emotions, you know, before and after, and and the Fiesta Bowl in '96. Those are just really, really special life experiences. Not just great games to watch, but for me as a kid growing up in Fairbury, to be able to be that close to that. I mean, just really, really remarkable. Um, the bowl trips are always fun because there's, there was such great camaraderie with everybody in the athletic department that was there, the Christmas parties and the little excursions and everything. So I, I, don't, I don't, my bowl experiences aren't necessarily the games. They're just it's a really good time with really, really good people and getting to go to some nice places. San Diego is fantastic. Uh, not a big game by any stretch, but mm-hmm. uh, yeah, but seeing Nebraska fans when it's 52 degrees in Miami flock to the beach in uh, in swimsuits was always quite a memorable sight. What about the the '94 Orange Bowl that '93 season against Florida State? Did you, uh, did, you, did you feel like something special could happen that trip? Yes, yeah, uh, because that was a really really good team playing great at the at the right time, you know, and everybody thought they were going to get smoked, and they didn't get smoked. And it, you know, it, that game kind of reminds me of what we watched on, uh, uh, with the national volleyball championship, you know, like it was Wisconsin. I said this last week, Wisconsin was the team of destiny and, you know, they ended up being, you know, fulfilling that destiny. And the same thing with Florida state and that, that orange bowl game, um, in what was it? 90, 93. I forget the dates when you have to play in January, um, the 94 orange bowl, you know, that was the team of destiny. This was Bobby Bowden's team. Remember, Nebraska outplayed him. But you just knew with that group of guys that that wasn't just a that a bowl trip. And thanks for the memories. That was they were they were there on a mission. Um, they believed they could win. Nobody else did, and they came up short. You know, missed a really badly missed field goal. No penalty called for roughing uh, the kicker or the holder. I think it was Dave Sizes. Sizes, yeah, he's um, with Lincoln, Lincoln yeah. East now. Yeah, he's, yeah, he, yeah. He got I mean, there should have been a there should have been a jacked. penalty in there. A right, bit. a few penalties. Right. <laughs> so that team, that team, that team left Miami, and you know, and I've told the stories about the summers and the off season that I got to witness. Uh, that team left Miami and just kind of had a feeling that when we landed, you know, back in Lincoln, whether it was I don't know January second, third, fourth, or fifth, whatever day it was, they were probably going to win the national championship the next year. Uh, did we think they were going to win the next three, the next four years, and should have won a fourth? Uh, no, but that team landed in Lincoln, ready to go back to Miami and take what was theirs. And so that was a memorable night too. Um, but th- yeah, that was that was that was a special night for Nebraska football. Even though they came up two points short, but that turned into destiny for Nebraska football. Bill, Merry Christmas to you, bud. Have a good uh, holiday weekend, and we'll get caught up in 2022. Wow, 2022. All right. I guess I'll be around. Merry Christmas to everybody. Thanks, brother. All right. Go Big Red. Chime in, 402-466-ESPN, or email the show, chris at hailvarsity.com. Just try me. Try me. Back to Hail Varsity Radio. Thanks for spending time at Hail Varsity, presented by the Nebraska Lottery Husker Basketball tonight. Uh, 
Does the pain stop? <laughs> Tip off 630 ESPNU, Kennesaw State, the mayor and company. Will it be different? Well, it's a different opponent. It's uh, it's not a power five or a high major. And Nebraska's been reeling, now five and seven. Uh, you got to put a whole uh, half a ball together, let alone two. And we'll see. This is Coach Hoiberg after uh, the tough one against Kansas State, already kind of looking ahead to Kennesaw State as they, they tip off here in about an hour. It's important. We need it. We need to, we need to win. We need to get some confidence uh, going with this group. And, you know, through this time, nobody's going to feel sorry for us. You can't drop your heads. you got to keep grinding, keep working, and, uh, and hopefully come out and play well on Wednesday. So right now, until you get Trey back, you really don't have an answer of moving Verge off to a two guard. He's going to keep trying to create and do his thing. He wants to win mightily, and and sometimes tries too hard. But I like the, the kind of the flip we've seen from Verge. Uh, now, do you follow through on either some threats slash promises from this week? And you had Coach Hoiberg talk about a running. Uh, more of a controlled offense, sort of. That happened, sort of. And then they went away from it. They were allowed to go away from it against Kansas State. Do you double down and go m- more through Walker? I know he had some turnover issues, but Walker is such a hustler. And uh, he is your elder statesman. He's your mature guy. He's your hard worker. He's going to will your team and do what's best for the team always. So do you, do you go through him tonight and continue to go through him tonight? Because just from a size standpoint, Elijah, I mean, he's going to go up against some bigger dudes, some bigger paint forces in the Big Ten. He's just he's going to be outmatched, honestly, physically uh, in Big Ten play. But the, the matchup-wise, technically you're supposed to be better if you're Nebraska in the paint, and you need to go through – Walker. When Nebraska hit their outside shots, it was either a hockey assist or it was Walker with a kick out to those shooters, those scores. So I, I hope they stay true to form where they go and stick with trying to go through Walker tonight offensively. Two, you take a bad or a stupid shot, you're going to come out. You got to have the old Tom Izzo school of no BS. You make a bad shot, you make a mistake. I ain't mad at you, but I'm going to pull you. And if you continue to do it, you're not gonna you're not gonna play. That threat needs to be followed through upon tonight. Well, yeah, and I experience that when I go play pickup basketball. As soon as I'm jacking up a bad three, I'm headed to the bench. Even if we don't have an extra person, my, my teammates are gonna sit me down and say, "Elijah, <laughs> go get a drink." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll play five on four for a second, Elijah. We don't need that in our offense. No, we don't. And, and you're like, I gotcha. Do you get that talking to quite a bit from Willie J? Uh. Well, or do you just? Well, I like playing against Willie J. So usually he's encouraging me to take those shots. Elijah, you're open, bro. I'll, 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 I'll give it to you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'll give it to you. He'll even take a step back and go shoot it. <laughs> <laughs> Wide open. <laughs> Yeah, but, that's unfortunate. But when you look at Derek Walker and his contribution to this Husker basketball team, from what my eyes can see, he's the only player who you know what you're going to get from him on a night in night out basis. Uh, you know he's not. The best rebounder, um, he's probably the best rebounder you have on the floor. He's not the best rebounder in terms of a, a grander scheme of college basketball because he struggles with the size. But on the offensive end, he sets good screens. Uh, he hustles and follows up. He finishes inside more often than he doesn't. He's good at uh, d- distributing the ball. Uh, it feels like he knows where the ball needs to go whenever he has the ball in his hands. I feel like he's Nebraska's steadying force right now offensively and defensively. And uh, I'm with you in that it, when the offense goes through him, it tends to work a lot better than when it just sticks in one guard's hands and they try to go iso ball, hero ball. There needs to – I hope there was a talk this week about trying to do too much from Fred to Bryce. I hope there was a sit-down. I hope there was a film session. You had him with Verge. Need to have him with, with Bryce as far as your step backs, your defensive intensity – and Nebraska needs to score 20 points tonight from the free throw line, whether the threes are falling or not. You need to attack the rim. And I know sometimes the contested shots, the block shots, all that stuff happens to Bryce, but he's so 
so elegant as well getting to the rim. I mean, he's he's shown against NC State, he's shown flashes of being able to, to get to the rim and finish at the rim. I mean, he, he's, he's, he's graceful. He's super talented. Mm-hmm. And that is, that's where he's going to need to to live is, is at the free throw line. And if you're open, don't be afraid to shoot it and go ahead and shoot it. But it doesn't need to be, you know, 30 seconds left on the shot clock between the legs, step back three, like you're in the NBA. You need to have that conversation with Bryce about trying to do too much about shot selection, why are we doing this? We want to win. This will help you as well with your aspirations to go pro. You're not a you're not a lottery pick, bro. Sorry, not right now, and probably not this year with this team. It's not that you can't go play in the G League or whatever, or or be drafted, but it ain't going as swimmingly as as you want. And it's okay. You're just a freshman. But man, with all those scouts, you're worried about showing off for. It's it's hurting the team and it's hurting you. You're going four for fourteen, and, and this isn't pinata time. I like the kid. I love the kid. Stand up kid, but someone needs to be the adult and say, "This is how we're going to do it," and walk that line of preaching shot selection and maturity on the basketball court with the basketball IQ because we know he has it. Versus the. Uh, the accountability side, well, it, where where you pull if if you get a little bit too uh, too far outside the lines. It, it's a coach's job to to help a player and get a player to to reach their potential. And with the way Bryce McGowan's is playing right now, he is not reaching his potential, and he's not on pace to reach his potential uh, because of the the shots that he takes. He, he's still he's still playing like the best player on a high school basketball floor. That's what it looks like to me, where you know the, the coach isn't going to pull me because I'm still putting up 32 points. This, ain't, this is an rebounds. AAU ball. It's, it's not AAU ball anymore. And I, I think it's Coach Hoiberg's job as a coach to help you reach your potential. And your potential is your insane athleticism and your ability to go beat a man off the dribble, get inside and finish inside is what's going to get you to the NBA. Right now, it's it's not your three-point shot because the three-pointers aren't falling. And the more you take, the more NBA scouts are just going to see it and go, man, I don't like how this kid hogs the ball. I don't like how this kid doesn't pass. I don't like how this kid is taking bad looks. Uh, it, it's just, it, it's not winning basketball. And if I can see it at home, I know the NBA coaches or the NBA scouts and NBA coaches can see it too. So it, it's Fred Hoiberg's job to be able to say, hey, in order to reach your potential, maybe we need to sit you down for five minutes uh, and get you out of those bad looks, out of those step back threes and get you back driving to the rim where you perform best. You get to the rim, even if the shot doesn't fall, you get to the free throw line and you're a great free throw shooter. You know, Coach Smith always puts a premium on, you know, what's a kid shoot in in high school and how does that translate to college and coming out with with McGowan's. I mean, the kid was was drilling 40, 41 percent of his three point shots. That's really, really high level in high school. He hit 40 percent of your threes in high schools. Really nice. Well, that's you're hitting half of that now at the college level. And it's you got to up your game and 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 adjust and, adjust and adapt. If I and it, well, as long as we're having that uh, come to Jesus this week uh, with with Bryce, I'm going to have a sit down with Kise as well. And I know you started two or three from three point land, but when Nebraska was up on K State, part of that little run they put together that nine zero, it was mid range. You can shoot other shots than three. You're you're at six three six four Kise and. Man, you, you're a good shooter, bud. And you're probably doubting yourself a little bit right now. What got you going? You got a little bit of penetration with that sweet left-handed shot for the mid-range. Keep going back to that. Or or create. So, it's uh, it's something to think about. Uh, and, and don't complain to the refs, either. He, he does that quite often. There's always some sort of palm looking up. No. Just, just play ball. So there, there's, again, it's Festivus Eve. I'm, I'm airing some grievances yeah, but, since it's basketball tonight. But with all these things we're saying, it, it's never too late in the season to, to start fixing some things, especially whenever you're going through the gauntlet of the Big Ten. 
Uh, I don't think any Nebraska fans are sitting here thinking Nebraska is, uh, is going to be making the NCAA tournament in the spring. I'm included in that. However, it uh, doesn't mean you can go have yourself a respectable NCAA or, uh, excuse me, Big Ten slate. Maybe go still try to make an NIT tournament. It seems like a pipe dream at this point, but it, it starts tonight with being able to go build confidence against a, a team that's not as good as you, to put it bluntly. The talent is not there from Kennesaw State whenever you compare it to this Nebraska basketball team. Uh, they just need to do what makes them successful offensively, which is getting to the rim, getting to the free throw line, and uh, knocking down the open looks whenever you get them and not shooting the looks that aren't open. It, 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 it seems so simple whenever you watch at home, but something's just not clicking for this Husker basketball team. So, last thought here from, from the mayor. Uh, he, he does touch on shooting, did so yesterday with their presser, and uh, confidence a big thing with this team right now. I am confident that we will make shots at some point. I thought the other night was the night when we started out 5 for 10 and took great shots. I uh, thought that was the night where we were going to take the lid off and have a double-digit three-point shooting effort. It didn't happen. Uh, we're 321st out of 328 teams in three-point shooting right now. I never in a million years would have thought that that would be our issue with our team. I had other concerns, but not shooting. So just continue to work. That's all you can do. You know, When I was a player, I just, listen, the only way I could get out of it, out of my head, was continue to get reps. Um, but it's a miserable feeling. I'm telling you from experience, it is a miserable feeling uh, when you know you can make them and they're just not going in. We'll see if they go in tonight, 6.30 ESPNU. Quickly, when it comes to the portal, we can spin the wheel and uh, know that Casey Thompson is still there. Uh, you have Emory Jones. Unless Did Emory go to Ole Miss? Did Ole Miss figure out their, their quarterback? You have Zach... Kelzada, the sophomore from A&M. How would you feel about Cameron Ward from Incarnate Word? Insane stance. Does he make the jump? Uh, I wonder if... I thought I heard something today about Ole Miss getting their quarterback. And, and Everyone I, else has. I was hearing the... Uh, there's nothing on uh, Jones or Ward yet, but I was, always, I was hearing that the smoke was that Cameron Ward was going to go play for uh, Ole Miss. Yeah. It was what I was so hearing. So Ward was the Ole Miss guy. Okay. So, and, and then, of course, you had Charles Thompson's kid who did pretty well uh, at Texas and then got dinged. Uh, you had Emory from Florida, uh, Calzada. I'd really look. I mean, one thing one thing uh, Jimbo has done is find quarterbacks, right? You get an a and Emory cycle. That couldn't totally suck. Uh, Purdy, I wonder if he goes to Iowa State. I think Hayner probably, you know, he's still out there, but he'll probably stick at Fresno. Jock Doc's on the way. It's Hale Varsity presented by the Nebraska Lottery. He's in his 30s, but sounds like he was born with a stogie in one hand and a brew in the other. Now, say my name. It's Schmitty on Hale Varsity Radio. I got the body of a taut, preteen Swedish boy. Back into it, it's Hale Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Time for a Jock Doc Wednesday, Lincoln Orthopedic Center. Dr. Brandon Seifert with us. Dr. Brandon, uh, you got the lights up, you got the tree ready. All you need now is Santa. How are you? Yeah, I'm great, Chris. You bet. We're ready to roll and maybe a few more few more things to wrap. Probably one of those late nights of wrapping stuff on Thursday night, but we're ready to go. How about you guys? Doing well. Yeah, we're excited for it and uh, can't wait for some some family time and it's uh, mm-hmm. a tough time down in Tampa when we talk about wide receivers. You had Antonio Brown that's been pretty much reinstated because of the injury situation. Chris Godwin, a stud wide out from Penn State, took a vicious shot, kind of a knee shot. It wasn't malicious, but he just got chopped down. And you know how the, the targeting rules and the defenseless receiver stuff go. Well, he took a shot below kind of the thigh, and that turned out to be a a hit that tore his ACL and spent some time on Godwin. You saw the hit, and did it look worse or more vicious, or as soon as it happened, did you know this guy might not be done, might be done for for this year and, and beyond? Yeah, you know, it kind of had that look to it, and it made you pretty suspicious for you if he did uh didn't knock out ACL. He's going to knock out one of the collateral ligaments for sure. Maybe the meniscus injury with that. 
Um, you know, we always talk here, Chris, on uh, with our ACL injuries about, you know, how do these, you know, typically occur? Obviously, you think about a lot of our high-level contact athletes are having these injuries occurred, so you're thinking contact's a big part of it. And, it, and it is to an extent. Honestly, the vast majority of ACL injuries that occur are, are non-contact. It's, you know, more of a cutting event or, you know, you land weird after jumping or you kind of take off the usual way when you when you are jumping in basketball so to have a contact one like this it's less common uh but obviously the trauma that he had is kind of a perfect mechanism for it and you kind of see that like oh boy that looks like that's going to be pretty significant when you look at the hit do you think the nfl figures out something a happy medium you don't want guys getting blown up above the neck obviously i mean we saw a run of head injuries or just some scary moments with you know, the board coming out uh, this past NFL weekend. You've had pretty bad back-to-back high-profile games. Your Sunday night and your Monday night were both dogs from a scoring standpoint. You have teams more and more with turnaround time three days, maybe four, if you go from a a Sunday to a Thursday, right? So, Mm -hmm. I mean, and and now you've added an extra regular season week. I mean, guys got to be wearing down at this point of the year, and you've seen some some sloppy games i go back to the injury question though with where guys are being told to hit and what type of type of tackle you're asking secondary players to make or just defensive players to make now in lieu of of trying to alleviate a lot of the the head and the neck trauma yeah you know that's a good point yeah and how do you and so you've made those changes to try to alleviate some of the the head injury stuff and so you've changed in the tapping methods is there a way to yeah, try to prevent some of those more lower extremity injuries now, and it's it's tough. Um, oftentimes, when you're making those tackles, and with as good as those you know offensive players are, you're you're barely able to kind of get a hold of them, or you're you're kind of coming off and being maybe off balance yourself mm-hmm. when you're trying to make that tackle. So I think just from a body control perspective, sometimes it's hard. Uh, but obviously, defensive players making that tackle as well are also you know, similarly talented. Um, so I think that's tough. I, I don't know what you would institute for, you know, some kind of regulatory mm-hmm. policy, but do you start looking at it? I think it's very reasonable. You know, I'd be curious to see some of the, the data that's out there since they started to emphasize more of the headshots. What's it look like in terms of injuries, you know, to that area? Um, so, yeah, definitely good thought there. Um, you know, the other thing I think that's really critical here, especially just in this day and age of volume, you know, it seems to be volume, volume, volume when we're looking at, you know, what our young kids are doing for sports. And now you look at the NFL, they're adding another, you know, game and they're playing on shorter rest. And I think that's a good example of how you increase your injury rates. Um, I, again, I'd be curious to know what, what some of those injury numbers are since they've, you know, kind of tweaked the schedule and, added a game and be curious to see what what some of those injury numbers are you're probably not going to see a huge spike in say some of these bigger injuries like acls but what you probably are seeing are a lot of these more kind of nagging injuries uh, which we always know that some of those nagging injuries can be a, a lead up to you know a big injury mm-hmm. and so i'd be curious to see what those numbers are dr brandon seifert's with us lincoln orthopedic center at jock doc wednesday chris godwin tampa wide out uh, done for the year in acl you mentioned to start off our jock doc, the majority of ACLs are non-contact. This was contact where you plant, you get cut out, uh, going over the middle, and and then you're lost for the year. Is is it more? Uh, is it a much more difficult repair, or is there more trauma with contact versus non-contact? Do you, do you go about it the same way, or is there? Um, is there a different uh, result long term with with ACL repair if it's a contact versus a non contact? Yeah, I know. Great question. I think, you know, from a data perspective, I can't give you any data specifically on that, but as I think about just in my own practice, mm-hmm. you know, some of the more significant um, ACL injuries we're seeing are with more of the contact related. You know, somebody falls on the side of your leg, right. you kind of cut from the side. I think those usually are more traumatic. Um, and really where I see that, not necessarily in, in the you know, trauma to the ACL, it's more than meniscus trauma. You know, we've talked right. before about your meniscus is that cartilage pad that sits in between the two bones. You have two of them on each one on each side, 
kind of C-shaped structure. Um, that's where we see more of the trauma. And, and as we've discussed before, you know, it's, it's those other things that you kind of add on to ACLs that really can slow you down and can kind of limit some of that return to play for you. And more importantly, how do you look down the road with arthritis and those kind of things? Um, and so, yeah, with more of these contact injuries, we tend to see more kind of higher level meniscal injuries, meniscus tears, uh, especially kind of towards that back of the knee and the outside, which can be really kind of devastating long term. But we also see some cartilage injuries too at a little higher level. Uh, but you also tend to see more kind of multi-ligamentous knee type injuries mm-hmm. on the contact side. You, know, you start to get hit from the side and it's kind of that whole wind swept mechanism. You go from the outside where you kind of push through the meniscus and you push through the ACL and then you kind of hit that MCL on the other side. Um, so yeah, I would say so. I, I, usually the extent of damage is a little higher on the contact ACL injury side. Dr. Brandon Seifert's with us, Lincoln Orthopedic Center, a jock doc Wednesday. Chris Godwin, our topic, Tampa Whiteout, done for the year with an ACL. Dr. Brandon, here about a minute. A thought on, on Godwin's recovery. He's been in the league a long time. He stayed pretty healthy. Is this something you think he can be uh, as good uh, or, or come back at the same level here when he's finally rehabbed and surgery's done? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think there's a high chance of that. Uh, again, I haven't heard specifics on you know, what else is involved in the ACL. That's always kind of our big question mark in terms of that, you know, return to play level or can you get back to the same speed. Uh, but I think he's got a good chance to do that. Um, obviously, age is a little bit of a factor, but you just you said it. He's been pretty healthy in his career. So, you know, we don't know what kind of previous you know knee trauma he's had, whether he's had some cartilage issues or you know, some meniscus issues in the past. Again, all those things tend to add up when you're looking at return to play. But if he's not had many of those, and I think his return to play prospects are very good. Um, I think from a speed and agility perspective, and he can get back to a level that he can be competitive with. Um, he'll probably be a little bit different. Maybe that high-end speed's not completely there, uh, but I think he'll get close, especially with the athlete that he is. Dr. Brandon Seifert with us. Lincoln Orthopedic Center at Jock Doc Wednesday. Chris Godwin, our uh, feature tonight. Dr. Brandon, uh, best to you and your family, and, of course, the great folks at LOC, Lincoln Orthopedic Center, and have a, have a Merry Christmas, and we'll get caught up again in the new year. All right, Chris. Hey, thanks, buddy. You guys have a great Christmas. Take care. Miss us? Come here, brother. Give me a hug. Bring it in for the real thing. We're on call for you. Catch the podcast at HailVarsity.com, the ESPN Lincoln app, or download them on iTunes. Saddle up, partner. Back to Hail Varsity Radio. One final time on a Wednesday, big thank you to Mike Babcock, Mike Shuhart with Wilderness Ridge. And, of course, uh, Pride of Fairbury, Bill Dolman. Tomorrow on the show, Brandon Vogel will take us into the Christmas season and New Year. We'll check in with Gary Barnett and uh, Danny Burke, Burke's Best Bets from Beeson Sports Network. Good luck handicapping some of the NFL and college with all the COVID garbage going on. Uh, so stay safe and healthy. Is uh, one more show for us. Uh, off Christmas Eve, and then uh, back at it. Well, you're you're back at it. I think uh, right after the uh, the new year. Yeah, it'd be January third. Uh, you're back the third. I'm back the fifth. Mm-hmm. So, are you heading down to uh, PBA tonight, or are you going to cozy up with a plate of wings somewhere and just watch? I think I am going to try to make it on down to PBA tonight because okay. uh, I think Nebraska basketball's got a good shot at a win tonight. Yeah. They should, and it, and it could be the last one for a while. You're referring to the holiday break, correct? Well, sure. Right. Yeah, yeah. Because if we look at Nebraska basketball schedule, I mean, we can absolutely ink in a lot of wins, right? They they have the talent to do it. But it is, I mean, look, you got Ohio State coming to town January 2nd, Sunday. That's their next outing. Then they're at Sparty. Sparty's up to number 11. On the 5th of January. Well, it's back-to-back wins to start off the non-conference slate. Oh, Pencil it in. Num- number 14, <laughs> number 11. Yeah, Andy Katz put out his preliminary uh, field of 64 plus 4. I'll, I'll always get that wrong. I will call the Chargers San Diego forever. I will call the Raiders Oakland forever. And I will say the field of 64 forever, even though it's been 68 for a lifetime. No, I, I just help me here. This when we're, if Nebraska's next win after tonight is where? Is it hosting Ohio State? 
Is it at Michigan State? Is it at Rutgers? Is it hosting Illinois? Is it at number three, Purdue? You host Indiana, you're at Ohio State, you host Whiskey. You get to go to Michigan. Northwestern's an 11 seed right now, projected. Michigan's a 7. Minnesota's in the tournament as a 10 seed. Is it at Iowa? Right before Valentine's Day? See, and all, all, I'm hearing Penn all this. State? And all I'm hearing is Nebraska's got their destiny in their own hands. If they can win out in the Big Ten slate, they could be a, a top five seed in the NCAA tournament. No, oh, you're right <laughs> on. You're right on. Well, let me know how that goes tonight. Mm-hmm. I don't think I'm going to get down there this time for it. I'm just hoping it's not one of those nights where uh, I'll be sitting there wishing that they had been You'd gone selling, somewhere else. No, wishing that they were selling hard alcohol within the stadium. Guess what? You can cross the street. <laughs> <laughs> sitting there for that uh, that Western Illinois game to start the year. Oh, that was rough. K State was a little bit rough, but we'll see if the the guys get it together. Hope they shoot better, man. Mm-hmm. If you're a Nebraska fan, I just hope they they play a little bit smarter ball. And if they don't shoot better, at least. Get to the rim and get get some free throw points, baby. That'll be key. Uh, Check the podcast out. Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, Hail Varsity Radio. Give us a rating, good, bad, or ugly. Excited to hear what you got to say with us. And talk to you tomorrow at 4 with Hail Varsity, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Thanks.